Welcome, 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 everybody. One within all and all that. (laughs) I'm excited for our show tonight. We've got the Beecher Preacher brother, Marty Leeds, a.k.a. Kevin Claudia Pavonis McNally, the uh, teacher of mysteries, preacher of the heart of the Gnostic Academy of Lord Jesus Christ. I have been in attendance and I guess in the membership of the Gnostic Academy for quite a long time. And although you may be, you know, taking a moment like, what are you talking about, Chance? Don't you rip on uh, New Age, Gnosticism, pop culture, simulation theory, demiurge, fallen world stuff all the time? And while, yes, I do, one of the things I love about our guest tonight is that he is a reclaimer of labels and an authentic uh, you know, truth teller when it comes to these mystic traditions like Freemasonry and the uh, Gnostic tradition, which just means knowing things. And he does not shy away from using words that other people have attached boogeyman labels to, including that 33 at the end of his name, Marty Leeds 33. And I really love his perspective on, uh, you know, the math of the Bible, the math of astrotheology. We have got so many, so many, so many great works to thank Marty for, including the pie in the English alphabet, volumes one through three, and Lord Jesus Christ, his uh, more recent book, and then Tonight, we're going to be talking about his brand new book called The Scripture in the Stars. And you guys know it. I'm all about astrotheology. We talk about it all the time. It's the root and basis of the mystery. When we say scripture in the stars, we don't mean that the scriptural stories were put up in the stars in the form of constellations. We're telling you that the constellations of the stars, the heavens themselves, are literally the scripture. <laughs> and everything that we've got in writing from every wisdom tradition and, and religion of the world are interpretations of this one universal story that is eternal and going on above our heads every night, every day. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show, Marty. Welcome back to Interverse. How you doing, buddy? Good. Thanks for having me. What else do you want me to say? You just nailed it. That's it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> the template of all the ancient myths is in the stars. Good night. it's so much fun though to like d i love the decoding of that template you know like uh there's a certain point where you're like i've amassed enough data that i'm positive i'm positive about this astro theology thing it's not a question but you know it's a it's one of those threads that is very rewarding to keep pulling from whatever angle whatever culture you might get into it from so um you know I've been watching your live streams on Sunday mornings. So, but would you maybe introduce people who aren't uh, following your work that closely to what's been going on in the last year or so over on your channels? Um, well, I started a church. Basically, that's it. Um, we've been doing Sunday service every Sunday morning at nine. And we're essentially like a church that is covering the mystery school tra- tradition, like you were saying. Basically, that's what we do. We focus on that. So that means like the Prisca Theologia. That means, you know, a lot of syncretic work, comparative mythological work, focusing on the ancient sciences, everything from, well, the, alche- the, the corpuses like the alchemical corpus and the hermetic corpus and stuff like that. But then also focusing on all the sciences that are surrounding those sort of mystery traditions is like astrotheology, as you're saying, astrology all of the, um, you know, even even things into like body work and stuff like that, the, you know, just that whole spectrum of stuff, everything from, uh, you know, of course we do gematria, number symbolism, et cetera, et cetera. So, but mainly focus on the Bible. Um, I mean, I consider ourselves a Christian church. I mean, we're called Lord Jesus Christ. So the focus is definitely on the Bible. 
Um, but as you know, when you, once you, you know, dip your toes into this, it's just sort of like you say, you keep pulling on it. It's like this endless thread. And that's really what the mystery tradition is all about. It's like this sort of, um, I don't know, I call it like the golden thread that sort of connects it all, you know, that behind the, you know, behind the exoteric is that esoteric thread that just, you know, really answers a lot of questions. And, um, I don't know, points to, uh, I don't know, the same things. So, yeah, I, I just love how you're reclaiming the idea of a church or a congregation from, you know, there's a strong argument. OK, so let me back up. My favorite thing about this whole syncretism stuff lately is the evidence of a universal system that these other religions are derived from. I say derived from just descended from like that. There was something that actually some seafaring peoples who were also priests of a sort uh, that had seeded these ideas these constellations if you will throughout the entire world from the americas to japan to asia and europe and all over and i think that that's one of the fun parts about pulling on these threads is being able to see that like yeah this is a universal system and once you have the keys to the pattern the patter <laughs> potter <laughs> the father you know i mean even down to the idea that whenever we're talking about the father it's the sky itself. The sky, the whole sky is the, the pattern, the father, you know, or yeah. Oranos, the sky father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know the, it's, it's pretty amazing because when, when I, when I was getting into this very early as a younger man or whatever, right. And I was thinking of the idea of God, the only way God would ever make sense was that it wasn't, um, you know, just exclusive or whatever to one line or one lineage or one religion or one spiritual doctrine or whatever. It was all of the, like God, his characteristics had to be universal. They had to be available to all people. They had that sort of thing. So when you talk about the canopy of the stars, the father, right? The, all the, the entirety of the heavens that shrouds us, right? That whole thing is a celestial template. And, you know, even given to us by the creator, like when he put the stars in those orders, it, you know, it was, it was, you know, for signs, you know, it was to like point you to something grander or a grander story that's going on the scripture and the stars, as we're saying. Right. And so, um, yeah, like, you know, just once you understand that, it's like you, you have that template, that's something that's universal to all people. You know, um, it's one of the reasons that we focus on math too, because math is something that's literally right in front of you. And so what I found over the years is that when you get to the core esoteric principles behind a lot of these traditions, that's what it's based on. It's based on those universal transcendental truths that are available to all people, you know, um, and the stars being one of them. And so hence why you have culture after culture clearly, you know, whatever, <clears throat> anthropomorphizing them, poeticizing the stars and the patterns that they are and making stories out of them that fit the cycles of the year and stuff like that. And that's what you have. You know, in my opinion, what I'm writing about clearly going on in the Bible. Unquestionably. Yeah, I love it, man. You know, the other thing about this, before I kind of get us into the meat of all of it, uh, about this universal system, is it when you start to research the history, you find that like the ecclesiastical system, a bishop at every ch church or temple uh, was already established before the Holy Roman Church set up shop. So it does appear for me, I wonder what you think about this because you've read so many old, uh, so much old literature. You know, what do you think about that idea? The, uh, that the maybe <laughs> Vatican, if you will, that whole setup was like a corporate takeover, like a hostile merger of a system that was already in place. And then basically, mm, you know, downgrading the amount of uh, information that would be available to people that were part of that system. If that makes sense, like lit literalizing, histor his historicizing uh, mythologies that were more widely known uh, already at that point and then kind of covering their tracks or attempting to. Well, the idea of an exoteric aspect of the mysteries is always there, right? So that's just always there. So, but the churches or the organiz organized faith peddling that as the true thing is and I think them doing that knowingly, right? Like you're saying, monopolizing on it, like corporatizing the whole thing, like essentially corporatizing the the religion and only selling the exoteric and 
knowing the esoteric, the, the true the true meat of the, the stories and what it's really all about and the sciences behind it, blah, 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 right? And just focusing on the exoteric and selling that to the masses. I think that's essentially what they're uh, they're doing. And I mean, as far as I can tell, like people of the mystical traditions, you know, which like I always say, that's an umbrella term that includes all sorts of, you know, people that essentially went into all the things that, you know, we discuss and, you know, all the avenues that we go down, um, you know, the, the people of that tradition, you know, basically, you know, I, I don't know. I think just understood the universal, uh, the universal wisdom tradition. They basically just understood that there was the, you know, one God and one creator, that sort of thing. So. Yeah. And they had versions of the mythology to give them an ability to allegorize things like the seasons and where you're at in the year. I mean, stuff that was really important for survival back then. So Marty, yeah. I have prepared. Oh, go ahead. About the churches. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say about the churches because it's like, it's so hard to suss out history. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah, it's yeah. like, I have no idea what's happened. All I know is that, you know, the, 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 you know, I think there was many traditions that understood what it was really all about. And obviously, because it's so powerful, really, I mean, it's really in this sense, the answer to life in that sense, right? Like, you know, it's seeking the philosopher's stone, that kind of thing, right? Um, the, the, the powers that be or should not be or will not be that whatever, they obviously recognize the power of that, obviously recognize the power of selling the exoteric over the esoteric, because it would be really applicable to the common man as well. And then hiding everything else, you know? That's obviously what has been done, what's happened in the history, in the past to bring that to what's happening right now. I have no idea. But clearly the churches have failed, I think. And or maybe they've been successful in that sense <laughs> of doing what, on what they're you know trying what I mean? to do. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? But if if yeah. they're if they're supposed to be bringing people to God in an honest way and really getting people into the meat of the book. And trying to understand what the whole thing is, what what's that, what's really going on? They're doing a terrible job of that. And if that's what the church is supposed to do, besides all of the other things, besides the communal aspect, besides the all the things that come with the church in a societal way, besides that, if they are supposed to be custodians and you know uh, of that sort of thing of the the mysteries, because that's really what it is, then yes, they're they're failing. So, yeah, man. Okay, so we're going to talk about your book in uh, some depth. If it's cool with you, I have created a few slides to go over some key material from the book. And I'm, you know, basically going to be pop quizzing you on your own stuff. <laughs> uh, don't worry about how, how in depth you do or don't want to go on to any of this. But, you know, I picked out a few of the uh, constellation images from the book and a few of the chapter titles. And I thought we would just give like a little sampler platter of this awesome book, Scripture in the Stars. Thank you so much for sending me a copy to check out. Earlier in the week, I managed to actually read the whole thing. So, I mean, not that that's really that tough. It's actually quite readable and very, very good, uh, good stuff. I mean, for somebody that's a student of astrotheology, the review aspect is always good to like solidify it in my mind. And then the new discoveries that you're making just by, you know, busting out a planisphere <laughs> and looking at the stories what? and being like, okay, what is, wh where does that line up? And I figure that's how you probably came up with some of this. And then some of it was probably like a, a passed on tradition from things that you've read and studied over the years. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's really a conglomeration of, of basically everything I've learned over the years, but as far as the tradition of, I mean, it's, I say in the first like chapter, second chapter, whatever the book that basically it's like, you know, this is a longstanding tradition of people making these correlations. It's not like this is anything new. You know, there's been entire books like there was one that we have Carl Anderson's, you know, the astrology of the Old Testament. You know, there's I mean, there's just a whole lineage. In fact, our friend Marlene just gave us some random books, some author I'd never heard of, I think in the 60s or something like that. But the whole book was on basically stories of the Bible being astrological. I didn't even check it out and, you know, whatever. So um, it's just interesting because it's nothing new. It's just like this has been going on for a long time. It's just the churches that are the sort of, um, you know, they they hold the narrative, right? They've 
cast, you know, they've they've cast the shadow over the occult or the mystic or that avenue. It's like, don't even go there. And that's worked, you know, over the years, of course. So, but uh, anyway. Well, well, I'll just take us right in here. I grabbed uh, Genesis chapter 14 through 16. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So basically what I would like to do is just kind of get your commentary on this idea of, you know, what is light? You had some really awesome points about that in the opening chapter. Well, I mean, I think it's just the point is that we can't eat, you know, essentially what there's what Genesis is telling us right now is just essentially that those things up there are lights and that's all. That's it. So they're not, you know, the, and so we say, okay, well, what does that mean? Right. So why are they up there? What does that mean? That sort of thing. And then they go on to tell you, it's like, okay, not only that, but this thing is for clocking time clearly. Right. And light is um, in a, like in a spiritual sense or a religious sense, it's defined as divine truth. That's how it's defined. And so, you know, when he's saying it's like, when we look up at the heavens, right? When you were saying like the whole thing is father, the father, God, right? The whole thing is ultimately this patterned express, you know, this patterned uh, template of light. That's an expression of God's divine truth. And that is what's shrouded over us. This is actually what is essentially being said in these opening verses. And as this, you know, pattern of you know, divine light is uh, divine truth is shrouding us. It's uh, for keeping track of time. And um, so ultimately what you can clearly see is that obviously that's what's happening. That's how we track time. But then you see cultures all over the world, basically looking up, making patterns of these things, creating stories. And um, yeah, you know, that basically tell epic tales of what, what life is down here. You know, what the purpose of earth is, what man's quest is, what his goal is, you know, ultimately that's not something that's just, okay, this is the point I'm, I need to make though. That's not something that's just like made up, you know, yes, the stories and the mythologies may be made up or creative expressions, but ultimately what they're telling is a story that's naturally or inherently embedded in the creation itself, inherently embedded in the cosmology itself. And that's ultimately a story of your religious spiritual quest. So, um, so it starts ultimately with the patterns of the heavens, which are metaphysical. Um, you know, that's everything that's up there. We can't touch. We don't know exactly what it is. And that's what they're saying. There's just lights. That's it. Um, but they're what, you know, what are they? What is the moon? What is the sun? What is Mars? You know, in uh, true cosmology anyway, that's all metaphysical, which means it's beyond the physical, which means you can't go up there or touch it. You can't feel it. You can't land on the moon. You know, we didn't land on Mars, et cetera, et cetera. So all those are ultimately there to be expressions of divine truth for humans. So, yeah, then, you know, the other point that you made that kind of changed my mind a little bit, I don't know what it changed it to, but in terms of astrology, I've always thought that the accuracy and value of astrology in any kind of judicial AKA prescriptive or a predictive sense was in how it was accurate as an allegory for the seasons and what happens at in the cycle of how nature builds things. And, you know, in a mathematical sense, like the order of operations that you have to follow. But then you made a point in the book about, you know, the sunlight brings out, brings about growth and healing and moonlight is actually a cold light. And knowing that then, should we not assume the other luminaries have unique influences as well that are maybe more subtle beyond like the axis of cold and hot? And, um, you know, that kind of blew my mind for a moment. I was like, maybe there is actually an influence from those lights and they're not just sort of purely symbolic. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the natural, I think that's the natural uh, conclusion because it's like when you say, when you know that, especially like we've talked about this and lots of people know this, like, you know, the planting of crops and all harvesting and all that stuff is based on cycles of the moon. Like when you put a seed in, you know, in the ground, lots of cultures have mapped that. In fact, we have a, a book, a small book about the Hawaiian, cult, about the Hawaiian people and like when they, you know, basically planted stuff and all that sort of thing based on the moon. 
And so that because it directly affected the crops. So it's like, okay, so if we know the sun affects us, we know the moon does, you know, those are just lights as well. One's a greater light and one's a lesser light. Yes, but just as it says there, but so is, you know, so what is Venus and what is Mars and stuff like that? And then you would say, well, how would you extract any sort of direct meaning from those things? Because they are metaphysical and they're up there. It's not like you can go and measure it or hold it or anything like that. And then you get into things like, well, you get into like the math of it. You know, uh, Venus is understood as a planet of beauty. And the v the cycle of Venus is 225 days. Cycle of the sun is 365. 365, 225 is, you know, 1.62 roughly or whatever. It's roughly phi, you know, which is you know, the golden mean golden ratio, that sort of thing, which is literally a proportion of beauty. So, you know, in other words, the relationship for the, between the sun and Venus is, you know, uh, in their yearly orbit gives you a mathematical proportion of beauty. And then we say generally, at least not, you know, not always, but uh, there's a lot of times that Venus is recognized as the planet of beauty. It's like, well, maybe there's a reason for it now. You know, so it's like, and I think a lot of those uh, the understanding of like when to plant and stuff like that was not only looking at the moon and when, you know, when the sun and w when it does things like that, but also the other planets and actually possibly mapping them mathematically. I mean, who knows? I mean, the level of genius of some of these people of our ancestors is, I think, uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't even <laughs> yeah, think it really indicates like a, like a devolution, yeah. not evolution. Yeah, I because when I, by Blind William McShakes back there, he was shaking. What was he doing? Kicking oh. his legs, dreaming hard. <laughs> good, good boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, cl clearly when you go back further, I mean, just the level, the level of reading comprehension and writing was just so much more. I love how more uh, like poetic it was too. Like uh, I want to do a, a live stream on the Rosicrucian stuff and the Rose. They were when they wrote, they were highly poetic. And I think that says so much about their mind state, you know what I mean? Like how they looked at the world, they, you know, they viewed the world as pure mystics. And so it was very, a, a very much a, a poetic existence. And that was uh, reflected in their writing. And it was just a high level of, you know, of, of, of uh, literature. So. Oh my God, I'm yeah, man, that's actually that. a really great point about, okay. So like we have the dogmatic churchians that they call the Bible the inspired word of God missing the point that the word of God means that it is literally the scripture of the heavens where the heavenly father is, which is the pattern. <laughs> and instead looking at it, like these are infallible words that must be taken literally. And by literally, we mean how our denomination dogmatically interprets it. And, uh, you know, I think part of what sort of lends to ammunition to that belief of like the inspired word, infallible word of God as like a history and all the sort of dogma that comes attached to that for many churchians is like uh, they don't understand how something could be so beautifully written, so poetic. So like, you know, as a literary work, such genius. But when we look back at our ancestors in the ages without as much distraction, they were on all levels accomplishing works of art at that level of genius, whether in sculpture, architecture, you know, the whole nine. And I think that's just, the Bible is a great example of, you know, some of the, the heights of human uh, potential in terms of creativity, which I loved you talking about in your stream earlier this morning, because this is like one of my core tenets and philosophies of life about creativity being like the authentic spiritual path. And yeah. I, I say that all the time because, you know, if you're authentically following a creative art and you are sharpening that skill, you will inevitably run into the necessity to work on yourself, to improve spiritually and in health and all that. Otherwise, you know, you hit a wall <laughs> in terms of how, how good of a job you can do. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the comment on the Bible, one of the things I like to point out is that I think it's a, it's just a poignant point that you're making there. It's like, I try to, I mean, I view the Bible just because that's the conclusion I naturally came to or whatever, was that, you know, you look at that piece of literature, like you would look at one of the Gothic cathedrals, right. And how it was constructed, like every brick, it, you know, is, is placed perfectly kind of thing. Um, at least in, in general, that's kind of how I viewed it because it was, you know, once again, looking at it, just like analyzing it as a piece of literature, it is a elevated piece of work. There's just, 
so many interesting things and things that make you like twist your head and what's going on here. And, you know, and it jumps from here. There's just all these things that are happening that, um, and I even write about it, Lord Jesus Christ, like all of these classic literary, um, devices that are used throughout it that literally that tell you that you're reading something very interesting, something else, you know? And, um, so yeah, to me, the, the Bible is a, is a masterwork. I think it's like, um, <clears throat> the point you were making about the word, you know, the point is, is like, Jesus is the word actually, right? So, you know, he is the word that's in the beginning was the word and the words with, and that's literally Jesus. And so people, um, relate that to the Bible and the Bible is really just Holy scripture. Right. But in order to understand that Holy scripture being th and understand principal things within it, like the word, that's a highly mystical concept that, you know, as I covered in the book as well, that you actually find cross culturally, it's this notion that there's a, like a sound that has created all of creation. In the beginning, this is the ohm, the word, there's the lost Masonic word. We talk about in Norse, they have a word, that sort of thing. So it's like, I think it's really hard for people to understand that like the Bible is this sort of knee plus ultra mystical book that's trying to, that really encapsulates all of these grand mystical ideas. And they're, as far as I can tell, they're in general, completely lost by most Christians. You know, there's so many things in there, like, you know, the alchemical marriage and, you know, death and resurrection and the hero's quest. And I mean, there's just, you can go on and on all the Zodiac man stuff that just all of that, you know? Um, and I'm trying to revive that to my best anyway. So yeah, there you go. Uh, the Zodiac man is a great aspect of uh, understanding the Bible, it's like you say in the book, it's actually impossible to really understand the Bible without this concept of starting at the head with Aries and going all the way around to Pisces at the feet. And you said um, in the book, is it possible that maybe just like our language, the Zodiac is perfect at communicating knowledge and transmitting information, which I'd love for you to expand on. And maybe I, I did this out of order, but I wanted to comment on Jesus being the word or the logos. So like where I'm at in my comprehension of all this is that to me, the sky, heaven is the sky, our heavenly father, Oranos, Yo, Jehovah, what have you. That's the whole pattern of the whole sky at once, the whole. And then there's the three in one of, you know, the characters of the Trinity acting out their dramas at, in the different parts of the sky. So if the whole pattern is the father, then the word is like the actual message that is inside of the different parts of the of the sky and the way that all the different heroes journey you know stories of various heroes of Jesus of Moses of whoever you you want to name from biblical history or even other religions is up there in that scripture in the stars to me that's the logos like the the words of that story and like all the, <laughs> yeah, the the whole tr the three in one aspect of the the Father or of God to me is that those three characters of the Trinity and sometimes four at the point when sort of mythologists didn't understand and and separated the uh, the regenerator and the destroyer and made a devil, <laughs> you know, a character number four. But anyway, um, you know, maybe expand on that and the Zodiac Man, which is so crucial to the uh the thesis in the book and interpreting the bible in general okay well I'll, I'll i'll give you my best to understand the trinity and the word and the relationship and what the word means and that sort of thing so when you see in the beginning uh god created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters and god said let there be light so it was the first thing that essentially happened to create creation um before essentially you know was was god speaking out was saying and let there be light right and this is this parallels directly to in the beginning was the word and the word is with god and the word was god right and so this notion is that the word is that creation is essentially made with sound and, and but there's i mean there's there's more to it of course i'm simplifying this retardedly but you know it's just basically like it's there's sound behind things obviously this gets into somatics this gets into frequency this gets into math and geometry blah 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 blah. but in the beginning god created the um uh, in the beginning was the word and god said let there be light so the word is this notion of the power of god that literally reverberates through all things and this would be the word and this is the power of christ that reverberates through all created things 
because everything comes from everything out of the mouth of God. Um, in fact, pi in Hebrew, I think, means mouth. Is that right? I'm pretty sure. It, I'm pretty sure it does. Anyway, uh, that's, so, beyond, that's beyond my knowledge scope, apparently. Uh, I, was, I was in some back closet back there. Anyway, um, so then we talk <laughs> about the Trinity, right? So the Trinity, there's a, there's a lot of things that the Trinity references, of course, just the, the fact that there's like a, a fundamental three in one in so many things in our world, you know, I mean, you know, man, woman, baby, you know, um, you know, this point, this point, this point, triangle, the three, you know, three points of accord, et cetera, et cetera. There's all that sort of stuff. But when you relate the Trinity to time, this is past, present and future. And that's actually a, a pretty one-on-one sort of general understanding of the Trinity, even in the um, Freemasonic Encyclopedia, it talks about the Aum, which is the word in like Hinduism. It's celebrated sort of all over, but you know, it's like Aum, that sort of thing. They'll even tell you that's, you know, creator, preserver, destroyer, creator, preserver, destroyer. And those three ultimately become the one expression of time because really it's sort of a trick it really is three in one there really Brahma isn't Vishnu a past Shiva in that instance yeah, exactly. there really isn't a past in the future it's really just that ultimate expression of the one moment of time that we as temporary you know in temporary bodies experience as a raw, slow kind of whatever but ultimately it's this one expression and that becomes christ which is the word that reverberates through all things that ultimate now that he's always present he is the he is the gift in a sense so so yes, because, you know, uh, three becoming one, well, that's actually what you experience in time because it's like, oh, it's like, you know, now, well, it's not now that's the past, but it's, it's still now, you know, but this, the future's coming, but that future's already, you know, that sort of thing. It's always this one fluid movement of time. And so that's the Trinity, the word and Jesus's role as the second person, because he's not the past or the future. I mean, he is, you know, he's the whole thing, obviously, but he's not the creator, the destroyer, he's the preserver. And the preserver actually would be the notion of literally preserving the entire experience that experiences the the now, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And v Vishnu of that trinity that you brought up, the Trimurti from uh, India, Vishnu would be the preserver in that setup. And interesting how Vishnu, if you do, if you like, look between Sanskrit to Latin, how they relate and how their alphabets relate, the V of Vishnu becomes an F. So you have Vishnu, Vishnu, just like Jesus is symbolized with the fish. And Krishna is, Krishna is basically Christ. And I, I mean, they, they share so much mythological correspondence. It's, you know, pretty inarguable that they are the same character and uh, in, in just a different literary tradition. And, you know the Jesus fish, <laughs> the the fish knew of it all. Even the B and um, the B is also interchangeable with F and V in old languages, depending on where you're looking. So Vishnu, oh, fish knew, bishop, fish up. Like <laughs> there's a lot of very interesting things that get revealed about the tradition whenever you start being able to see how the language also brought about evolution in it all. And don't the bishops wear the mitre hats? You know, the mitre hat? Fish hat. Yeah. It, which is crazy because people think, you know, this is what... Bishops are the really little good. fish of Vishnu, as uh, my friend Dylan wrote in Spirit World, his <laughs> awesome series about this stuff. Oh, nice. Um, I mean, that's the cool thing about, like, sort of the, the mysteries, because a lot of this stuff is like, you know, why is he wearing such a stupid hat? Because it is kind of a stupid hat. But then you realize that those things are actually pointing to transcendental universal truths about about mankind and you know god and his relationship to all that sort of stuff you know i mean the fish symbolism pointing to the vesca Pisces and everything that is involved with that simple geometric symbol is just ridiculous you know and then you see you know christ within that symbol everywhere and it's like okay well you know those symbols that you find in the bible like every time you see fish and that sort of thing it's like there's it's it, it, they become alive it's like no they, those things have really potent sometimes sacred geometrical more often than not sacred geometrical or and or cosmological references and meanings it real world in your life right here and now meanings and that's what we mean when we bring these 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 uh, symbols and terms and things out of the bible out of the page and into the stars and and that sort of thing so it's like you know when you see a fish or a ship in the bible it's like no that's like that's up there, you know, so it's, um, 
it really just once again just w- opens up the the Bible and makes you realize that these the, you know that the, these symbols and all of the stuff are just crazy, crazy meaningful. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. Let's get into some of the let's get into some of the nitty gritty. I picked a few choice selections. I really like the section on Saint John in the wilderness and baptizing people in the river Jordan. So I'll read this Mark chapter one, verse six. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. So that's uh, that's a fun one. Like, you know, why, as you so aptly pointed out into the book, why, why is the Bible telling us that John is eating locusts and honey? It's so crazy because people that argue for like the literalist version of this stuff, it's like, what what do you say to this stuff? Like of all the information that we could have about what happened in these people's lives and who they were and how old they were and maybe what children they had or the, all this sort of stuff. You know, you're in the middle of a story about Johnny Boy here and you're, you know, it's like he's eating. And what is he doing? He's eating locusts. And like, why do we know? Why is it important that we know what he's eating? It just, you know. It's stuff like that that's in the Bible that just jumps out. It makes you be like, what does this mean? You know, that's it's literally begging you to be like, here, I'm going to throw at you some crazy shit and then be like, what does it mean? Kind of thing, you know? And so, yeah, well, I mean, here you have, uh, as, as I'm showing here, uh, John was clothed with camel's hair. And this is camel lepardalis, right? Um, a girdle of skin about his loins. A girdle is, of course, a belt and a, like a lower, you know, the girdle. I think everybody knows what a girdle is. This is a reference to Orion's belt. Um, a girdle of skin about his loins, even. And he did eat locusts. And the locust is the constellation Lacerta, which is uh, actually a reference to uh, grasshoppers, lizards, but locusts. And then the wild honey is uh, is the beehive in Cancer. And so that's a it's an asterism in Cancer. And so you have all of these references. So it's like this absolutely ingenious encoding of the living stars in your night sky in one verse of the Bible. And it's all surrounding the pole star, which is um, which is essentially the center of the, you know, the celestial sphere. Yeah, I I was really is really helpful whenever you pointed out. The first time I heard you pointed out, because he pointed out again and again that the wilderness in the Bible is <laughs> the sky. <laughs> you know, that wilderness is a place where nobody lives, nobody goes. And obviously nobody's going up there. Um, you know, and another thing well, about this that I well, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, can I say this? When you start with, you know, you have to understand what the like the Bible is. And so when if you start with recognizing it's like Kabbalistic and it's astrotheological, right? You start with that presupposition and then you go into the Bible, you you know, once you start with that foundation, then it's like it, it makes it a lot easier to make these you know direct correlations because it's like, OK, then you can go into specific words and it's like, OK, what does this mean in relationship to, uh, you know, the stars? And so, um, you know, because that's the tradition. It's literally like, you know, that's what I was saying, that there's literally a bunch, you know, loads of books that are that are about this. And they're basically saying, look, this entire thing, you know, um, at least many of the books are clearly astrotheological. And so if you start with that foundation, then it's like it's a, it's one of the keys, you know. Um, I mean, Pike said that there's no way that you could possibly understand Revelation without Kabbalah and, you know, essentially astrotheology or astrology star study there's just no way you could do it i, I totally agree because it's just the, the everything that's in there is just so insanely cryptic and it's done so g- ingeniously you know yeah super ingeniously you know i have so this is not a claim but one thing that the whole idea of camel apartheid makes me think of is how you know a, a camel i'm sorry a uh, a giraffe which is what camel lepardus is supposed to be has like the same similar patterning as a leopard, hence maybe the name Camelopardus. And the uh, mm-hmm. the Pardes or the Padres, you know, think of like the what we know about ancient Egypt. They would often clothe themselves in leopard skins. And this was even true in like the Americas. So this was like a symbol of the holy man <laughs> wearing that. And uh, interesting too, you know, this word camel, 
uh, is very close. This is not a claim, but just an observation. It's very similar to the Japanese word kami. And in modern pop culture, the kami are seen as like spirits or gods or what have you. But you know, I've been doing a lot of research on the actual occult tradition of Japan and in the uh, sort of apocryphal <laughs> occult, occult works of Japanese uh, para history, you might call it, where mythology and history blend together in the origin of the world. And you have epic poems very much in line with like an Iliad or Orpheus's work, but in the Japanese. Um they were talking about the kami being actually like uh, a, a noble, like a noble class, like a priest class, possibly even like foreigners who sailed there, like very interesting stuff. So I point that out just because like the kami, if they aren't spirits or demigods and they're like holy men, well, <laughs> maybe they're also wearing, you know, the skin of a camel, camel lepardus. I don't know. Just a wild speculation high octane speculation <laughs> well the i mean as far as we know the like the egyptians whatever that is <laughs> at this point because it's all speculation but you know like the Dendor dendera stone that actually comes from you know the egyptian it was temple of karnak or something i'm not i don't remember exactly where it's from but Half all the constellations is that where it's from all I the constellations are um pretty much the same that we have today and so, and this has been pointed out by a bunch of different writers. I think I include one or two in the book. Um, um, E.W. Bullinger being one of them. Anyway, um, so it's like, how long has this been passed down? I mean, how long has this thing been around? And how many times has this been reiterated in Latin and Greek and freaking English and whatever, you know? Um, whatever it is, it seems to be a system that's, you know, has had some great, great antiquity. And so, you know, that, that's, says a lot so a lot of people will blow off you know um you know the zodiac astrology and stuff like that because they're like well it's just a bunch of made up shit you know but maybe that's yes it is obviously there's not a lion up there and a scorpion and stuff like that but you know in making up that stuff maybe that is a system that has been encrypted and has been you know uh you know intentionally to pass on high wisdom for future ages you know because it is a um it is you know the whole thing is a um it's a mind construct Right. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that can always be passed on. It, you can't kill it in that sense. You know what I mean? So um, much like our alphabet. Which is why the, uh, the hero reincarnates in all these different forms, whether he's o Orion or John, Elijah, Jesus, because John is said to be the reincarnation of Elijah. Eli yeah. And uh, John also has a name. You're right in there in the same uh, ballpark is like John Janus. Janus is the, you know, the God that's the, the gate of the year, just like Jesus, his birthday is at that transition point between the old year and the new year, you know, the acceptable year of our Lord. And right here, you know, baptizing in the river Jordan at the feet of the Orion constellation, you have a big river and he's walking Orion, Osiris, John, Jesus, whoever he happens to be, depending on the story is walking on water or baptizing people in the river. There's a bunch of different ways that that plays out. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the whole river theme is just so big and it's like, you know, and it's like, here you have one in the sky. I don't think I've ever heard anyone really mention it. Um, but, uh, actually I have a book for you. It's, um, Oh, what is it? Meta the uh, Ovid's uh, metamorphosis, right? That book in that book, they just come straight out. It just, tell you that like these gods are constellations you know what i mean it's like oh this is freaking Boates and this is draco and you know what i mean and so it's like i don't know it's like once again when you use the the celestial sphere as the template for all these stories it's like okay every time you come to you know a, a, a river in a lot of these all right now you actually have a river in the, the sky and it's not just something that was you know uh placed on there in some contemporary time as far as we know this has been around for a really really long time and so and like i like i've you know i've done other cultures but i like i said i think the bible stuff is pretty damn clear at this point getting christians to admit that or see that that's a totally different discussion <laughs> topic but <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a yeah thing. yeah there's so many like <laughs> things we could just pick out of even this story but uh, I'm going to jump us forward a couple here. 
Uh, we might come back to the Jesus tempted by the devil because that's a good one. But one of my favorite ones to consider, because it kind of gave me a new insight when I was reading this passage of the book of Joseph of Joseph of Arimathea and the sepulcher. So I'll read the Bible verse here. And when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus's disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So let's see, I'll give you the, uh, <laughs> I'll give you the, I have like three slides on this, but you know, this is also, there's also an aspect in this chapter that you're talking about him being the carpenter's son, which kind of connects to what we were just talking about because Jesus is also bar panther, son of panther, which gives you that um, Padres, uh, that leopard word. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, let's um, well, maybe uh, dive into uh, dive into this sub yeah. section here. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, basically you have just like you hear in that story that like the whole crucifixion scene happening, um, Joseph of Arimathea, right? Arimathea, we have no idea where that place is, but it it's like arithmetic and math. It's pretty much in that word, Arimathea, right? Um, Joseph means he will add. And I think, of course, J Jesus's dad is Joseph. And his, of course, he was a carpenter. Joseph's dad was known as Healy. So Jesus's grandpa was known as Healy, which is the root word of Helio. So, so in other words, what you, you just said is what I had the big flash of aha about was like, you know, at Jesus's death, there's a guy named Joseph. And at his birth, his dad is named Joseph. Like there's all, this type of rhyming from story to story in the Bible is replete. But if you don't know what you're looking at, you just don't think about it twice. You're like, oh yeah, they're just both named Joseph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, in the sky, when you relate that to the sun dying in the winter, you know, you're you're in this section of the sky. So you have the Southern Cross. Right. And a lot of people have made that correlation. Once again, a lot of a lot of people know that or at least a lot of contemporary modern people know that through Zeitgeist. But Zeitgeist got their stuff from the once again volumes of literature on the subject basically making these correlations you know that you have that southern cross right so there if you're for you have joseph taking him down from the cross well joseph means he will add he's from arimathea which means you know which is basically a creative way of saying arithmetic and math and that sort of thing and you know he's taking him down from the cross well right by the cross is literally norma circanus and the triangle which is, you know, the, the, essentially the tools of your your surveyor's level and your compasses and square, which is your carpenter's your carpenter's tool by a guy named Joseph and da Jesus's dad was Joseph. He was a carpenter. Blah 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 blah. He means he will add, etc. So it's all right there. So it's like they're giving you all these subtle little clues to make the connection, and they're all right in the sky. What is also happening during this time is um, there's a centurion that shows up and stands over against Christ as he's on the cross or as he's off the cross so a centurion shows up well right, as you can see right by joseph there right over standing over him is the centaurus which is you know basically the the root you know the same root of the word centurion centaurus that sort of thing so in this whole crucifixion scene you have all this going on then you had just read that joseph represented by the tools of the carpenter who's right there just went over to the sepulcher right and then you know rolled the stone right and so just to the left of that is ophiuchus and that's the serpent holder and that's the coffin so there's a there's literally a coffin right there um and then the stone is you can't see it but is right below there and that's the keystone of hercules so it's actually it's, i think it's on the other side but um so it's all yeah, it's like literally they're giving you all these little subtle keys to make the story in the stars. And then you go to the stars and it's it's all right in a row. The other thing is there was only one disciple that was at the crucifixion, so, which would be represented by the Southern Crux, the cross. And that was St. John. Well, if you look, there's the centurion standing over Jesus. There's Joseph, which is Norma Circanus, you know, the 
tools of the carpenter. Right there is St. John, which would be rep represented by Scorpio, and we talk about that. And then you have the sepulcher, which is the star asterism of Ophiuchus, the star asterism of the coffin. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, and I want to even I want to talk more about the Hercules connection. Maybe we'll get into that in the second hour, being that Hercules is, you know, covertly Hercules is Jesus and Jesus rolls the stone away from his own tomb. Well, the stone that is rolling away is literally part of Hercules. So by Hercules is running through the sky, he's moving the uh, <laughs> he's rolling the stone away. But. Yeah, yeah. You saw, um, you caught my episode a while back in December with John McHugh, the scholar on cuneiform stuff, right? I'm not sure if I did. I, I saw you in the chat. I'm pretty sure you caught it. Well, anyway, this dude, he is doing a similar type of work to, you know, it's archaeoastronomy from his end, but he's put adding in astrology to it. He's He's learned how to read cuneiform. He's learned like, Cuneiform, the Sumerian and Akkadian uh, system of writing, is tremendously, uh, you know, convoluted in the way that their writing system required them to do a lot of abbreviations called logograms. And in co with context, because like no one was literate, but the priests, they and different regions would have different ways of abbreviating things. It got, you know, kind of crazy how assuming that even it's you know in terms of a scholarly tradition and academic tradition honest and real <laughs> we but because it supports all the astro theology uh that we can determine it from elsewhere i t i tend to accept it i mean i can't say that i can make a claim that it's absolutely true and real cuneiform is authentically as old as they say i can't make any of those claims but the fact is like i just wanted to point out one aspect from i think you'd like his book it's called scripture not scripture in the stars. That's your book. His is called the uh, celestial code of scripture, I believe. And I think you'd really yeah. enjoy it. So I'm just going to bring out one little detail from that, because this helps us understand the Joseph is Jesus's father and Joseph of Arimathea showing up in the Bible. So Joseph, as you pointed out, was the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word, meaning he adds or he increases. So very natural to call him Joseph of Arimathea, which is like arithmetic. <laughs> okay, so in, in the constellation Leo, you have the star Regulus, which is the royal star of Leo. And Regulus in, this is like a very condensed, um, I'm going to be giving a very condensed version of this, like, you know, summary. But Regulus was called Sharu in ancient Sumerian or Akkadian. Sharu can mean child or king. Because of the simplicity and the primitive nature of this language, a lot of words were, you know, meant the same, same phonetics, same sound, different meaning. You know, some of the abbreviations had like a dozen possible meanings based on context. And uh, I want to expand on this, but the logogram or abbreviation for Sharu, a one of them, because different regions had different d decisions on what would be the abbreviation. One of them is add which can also represent father. And then an, alter, an alternate logogram for Sharu slash king is Lugal, which phoneticized the logogram that meant to increase. So we're looking at like homonyms here. So in a very simplified way, he explains it in a little more detail. The star Regulus to the Sumerian Akkadians, you know, and if you go back in the, the Old Testament, look at like the book of uh, Daniel, for example, he's a Babylonian magi. You know, they're talking about these are this is the Babylonian Magi tradition here. And in that tradition, the the name of the star Regulus encodes not only child king, uh, which would be Jesus, but also father and he increases. So the word he increases and father are together in the same star of Regulus, giving us, you know, the name Joseph whenever it gets brought into the Greek slash Hebrew in the name he increases. So I'm just bringing out this level of granular detail to demonstrate that, like, you know, I'm not claiming that the the Babylonian Magi are the origin of the system, but this is how the scripture in the stars was read. And, you know, you give examples of this later in the book with like uh, the Talitha Kumi <laughs> phrase, which I, I've got slides on, too, and we might get into that in detail. But I just think I think you would like this um, 
this guy's work because you know he's bringing the uh the mystery back to where it's from which is the sky and it's you know it's a little bit <laughs> dense in terms of the uh the wording diving deep into the the word plays but you know you're you're like that with math so i figured you'd probably dig it and yeah so this is just sort of like a potential origin or uh, explanation of where they're getting this name joseph he increases and in the same story of jesus being born it's also part of the story of him you know being crucified because if you look at your planisphere you'd be seeing those constellations you know this part of the sky at the same time with each other so they're looking at what they could see all at once and writing a story out of that and i believe i personally believe that's where the mythologies are coming from the wordplay and uh, multiple meanings in the names of stars asterisms constellations etc and uh you know just wanted to throw that out there for everybody <clears throat> The, the, the you know there's something interesting about how this information gets passed on to language to language and culture to culture and stuff like that and it, how is this was this designed did somebody etc there's all these questions that really nobody has any answers for but there is something to be said that in the mystical tradition like um you know one of the things that i came to the conclusion i came to when looking at the mathematics of the english alphabet was that all of these you know uh, the whole study pointed to god Right. So, you know, one of the first things I did in the cipher and was looked at Lord and God and heaven and earth and stuff like that. And there was this strong, um, a very strong notion that, you know, this God, you know, God is that is is working with his creation. He's not like separate from it. He's he's with it. So it's like when these things get passed on to culture to culture and however, however it happens, God is doing his little magic works and his magic tricks and stuff like that and being creative in the unfolding of this and sort of how it how it goes. And yeah, so it's that, like you know, synchronicity, that's... Marty. It's like, um, it's you know, the, yeah, the yeah. ancient the astronomer priest. The reason why they are doing like McHugh calls it Lumashi, which was the Sumerian word for this constellation writing that we're talking about and when they discovered word plays polysemy poly, uh polysemy you know multiple meanings of the same phonetics etc these pu priestly puns when they discovered that they considered that to be the revelation of the logos the, the the word of god coming through that like they didn't plan for this to also mean that and for there to be this interplay and in, in punning going on and because they discovered it and they discovered it up there in the scripture of the stars that must be the revealing of the actual wisdom, the word of God. And the amazing thing is when you start to study this stuff, as I'm sure you know, that those type of revelations and synchronicities with them literally do feel like God revealing things to you. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. I don't know what else to say other than, other than that. So, you know, there's just a line, I forget, I think it was, I think it was Albert Pike. But he was basically just saying, like, the one connecting thread through all these is that there is this God that's, you know, ever present, knows everything, is 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 working with the creation and is, is helping humanity pass on what he wants us to know to make sure this stuff stays alive. Like, he, you know what I mean? That sort of thing. And so um, the phonetics thing is so interesting because a lot of people blow off phonetics because it's easy, just, just like mantra it's easy to, for a lot of people to make shitty connections or you know go off on crazy tangents and stuff like that but phonology is a very legitimate study and you can't really even deconstruct a lot of times real true esoteric or you know mystical meanings of words or even ideas in the bible without directly utilizing phonology you know and let me give you an example just so the the one most the, the obvious ones right would be Jesus being the son and son S O N and S U N you know that's just a blatant right you know in your face connection to say hey this is this is in one respect talking about the sun in the sky you know it's just simple things like that that is directly related to phonology that really opens doorways into what the true meanings of the stories are and you you can go into everything from Noah to Emmanuel to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, oh, we uh, we did sacrifices to the god Dagon. You mean Dragon? You know, that's, you know, this sort of thing, that kind of thing. So all, there's so much of that in the Bible. And, and it's a, I think it's a huge key to unlock the some of the true meanings of the stories. Um, Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Creative thinking. 
because <laughs> we're talking we're we're trying to comprehend the creator so thinking creatively is very crucial um not to be like yes. ridiculous as you point out with the gematria, gematria uh on the internet and all that although you know i will i'm not saying this isn't exactly a pushback but in like maybe some defense, because uh, I know how you feel about Jamatra Nader, that channel. And I'm actually friends with that guy. He's a good guy. He, and he like, you know, if you talk to him, he, uh, he is a Christian and everything. But I, I see why you, you know, consider that type of work to give Jamatra a bad name because it's very specific in the ancient world. You know, 608, we're talking about something very specific. You know, it's not like flim flam. But in some sense, I think maybe guys like that are having the experience of feeling led by something and connections and, and stuff coming through and bet reading between the lines, like God is speaking to them. And, um, you know, if you talk to that guy in particular, oh. Jamatronator, he'll say, I'm not saying that anyone's doing this on purpose. I'm saying that like God speaks through numbers and words, uh, to us, which I, you know, I can respect that. I can also respect why one wouldn't like that particular flavor of, uh, <laughs> mathematical gymnastics. God speaks to us all the time. I think the 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 um, <laughs> the di the most difficult thing is learning to understand what He's saying, right? So, in this sense, because uh, I've had this many times in my life, where it's just like, oh, there's there's idea, I'm getting it, or whatever. But then you try to dictate what that was, and it didn't come out that well, kind of thing. You know what I mean? There, there's a thing that happened that this this happens like we've seen all the time that you'll hear something in your head and the really good musicians can just immediately, it can come out their fingers and that's years and years of discernment, being analytical, you know, all of the things that comes with being a, um, you know, a holistic sort of, you know, thinker and sort of Renaissance, you know, scholar or whatever you want to say. So, um, so anyway, the, I, I think people get in that flow state and stuff like that and actually do, you know, feel like, oh, it's like God is directing me and, and probably is, but you might not get, the, you know, receiving all the right signals. You know what I'm saying? You might not be dictating it all correctly is all I'm saying, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in the, uh, the effort to make the new video of the day or to solve the riddle, you know, seeing connection, getting to the point where like, you know, uh, we'll just drop this topic, but <laughs> <laughs> I see your point with the Jamatronators of the world, but also I like that guy as a, as a person, but anyway, um, we're at the end of the first hour. We're going to hop over in a minute. We're going to take a short, you know, musical intermission, bathroom break, what have you. And then we're going to, we're going to be on the, uh, the rock fin only side. Marty's got a rock fin. So, you know, if you want to support him rather than me and sign up for rock fin premium through the Gnostic Academy of Lord Jesus Christ, the link to that is in the description to the show here, or you can sign up through my channel or you can wait for a little while and get it through my Patreon, but we will be going to the uh, premium members only second hour. But before that, I would love for you to please tell people how they can support your church and your ministry, connect with what you're doing. You know, I dropped in the, the uh, live chat already a link to pre-order the book, which I have personally done as well, uh, although I've already read it. <laughs> but it'll be a great reference for, you know, the future. And uh, yeah, you know, like, what do you want people to know that how they can support you and how they can keep following you? GnosticAcademy.org. And that's it. It's the best way. Basically everything through the site. So you can get all the like bit shoot and all the other channels there. You can do the donations and um, that sort of thing. And then um, Sundays, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, we do sermons. And that's live on Rockfin, live on YouTube. And so, yeah, that's the best yep, way. And, yeah, and then your every favorite uh, Interverse, Interforce host, Jace Gardner, Interforce. is always there in the live chat. <laughs> yes um and all the stuff like that i produce you can only get through the site right so you can't go to like amazon and get my books or anything like that so it's all through the site yeah man get in there get marty's books all of them are great uh particularly i really love just the classic pie in the english alphabet <laughs> go go for it i'm still working on lord jesus christ but it's also great but it was a real page turner to read the new one um and I'm going to drop a link now for people to come over to our Rockfin and continue on the journey. And we'll take a short intermission. And uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging out with us on YouTube. And I do hope to see a lot of you on Sunday mornings with Marty's morning uh, Sunday morning sermons. It's always fun.
And thank you for uh, for your time. And I'm looking forward to going deeper on the second hour, brother. Thank you, man. Let's do it. Thank you.